listening to The Edge, everything bass fishing, coming to you worldwide from MegaWin Kill Guard Studios. Hey, 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 wow, man, holy mackerel, the December 15 edition of Bass Edge Radio, man, 2023, going, goodbye, Cyan Hard. This is the last episode of Bass Edge Radio, man. What an interesting year it has been. Man, I got to thank you all for obviously joining us and wish you a happy holidays, man. It's uh, coming up real quick. Christmas, New Year's, Hanukkah going on now. It's just uh, lots, lots of moving parts here at the end of the year and uh, excited for what 20. 24 will bring. Man, that final Bassmaster Classic spot, we talked about it here on the program. The Bassmaster Team Series down at the Harris Chain of Lakes in Florida wrapped up, and we got history in the making. The youngest classic qualifier ever, 17-year-old Andrew Yavorsky out of Palm Harbor, Harbor, Florida. Andrew and his dad fished the team championship. The top three teams after two days of fishing made the classic fish off. Aaron and his father made the classic fish off. Aaron went on to just freaking annihilate the field. Had 31 pounds that first day in the classic fish off. He had mid-teens the second day. Pretty much just wiped the floor with that championship, man. It was uh just really kind of blowing it away there in the fish off. I mean, the other the other five competitors, one of them including his father, of course, because they both qualified there for the fish off. I think his dad pretty much said, Aaron, here's your opportunity. Try to make the classic. Aaron, young man, he made he made it work. So congratulations to him. And um man, before we get too deep in this episode, as always, you know it, Bass Edge brought to you by MegaWare Keel Guard. The Keel Guard that's providing you protection from grinding salt, abrasive rocks, concrete boat ramps. Don't be without MegaWare Keel Guard on your vessel. Man, make sure you want to tune up your rig for 2024. Man, there's a lot of great stuff with KeelGuard.com. Skeg Guard, obviously. Battery Guards. Man, pr protect those lithium batteries. So. Uh, that's also something you're going to need there, but uh, um, as well as the uh, scuff buster and the flex step, man, easy to get in and out of your boat. So uh, appreciate them being along with us for another year. Like where it's been with forever and ever and ever. Happy to announce they're going to be back for 2024 when we kick off the new year. So uh, thank them for sticking around and uh, providing the ability to give you all this content through Bass Edge Radio. Man, a little bit of a of a tear here, but you know this is going to be the final episode of Bass Edge with the partnership for Nitro Boats and Bass Pro Shops. Man, obviously everyone at Bass Edge, and I speak on behalf of Aaron Martin, the creator of Bass Edge Radio. Man, they have been with Aaron and Bass Edge brand for so many years, all the way dating back to 2006. So what what a what an outstanding length and awesome partner Nitro Boats and Bass Pro Shops has been to Bass Edge Radio. Um, we're gonna have an announcement though. We're excited that uh, we're gonna have a new partnership coming up in 2024 that we are extremely grateful for. But uh, nonetheless, thank you, Bass Pro Shops, Nitro Boats. Appreciate your involvement with Bass Edge Radio for all those years. Um, Man, uh, some new news on the tournament scene. A new wrinkle just announced in the Bass Pro Shops Tour. Uh, the, excuse me, Bass Pro Shops MLF Bass Pro Tour. There's a lot of Bass Pros going on there. But, man, they have just announced they are going to uh, not reduce the field as quickly as originally announced. They were going to take the field from 80 to 50. Now it's going to be more of a long-term progressive decline in the field size. In 2024, they're going to fish 80 anglers. 2025, they're going to fish 65 anglers. And now the field will be reduced for 2026 to those 50 anglers. This on behalf of the 
angler committee that, of course, MLF takes consideration of. So uh, great to hear that MLF heard the angler's voice and they were able to, uh, you know, I don't want to say backtrack, but kind of ease that process into that 50-man field. Also very interesting is they are going to be upping the ante on the winner's take for these events coming up in 2026. Uh, it's either 2025 or 2026. I, I didn't quite totally understand the news release, but $150,000 to the MLF Bass Pro Tour angler that wins each event coming up in 2025, 2026. So really exciting to see that because we have not seen enough increases as costs have increased anglers to participate and be a professional angler we have not seen those increases come back so it's it's great to see that up to $150,000 for the winners of each MLF Bass Pro Tour event coming up uh, that's that's uh, awesome to see man today we are going to have BASS Elite Series Angler sophomore coming up in the podcast uh, he's going to be fishing the 2024 Bassmaster Classic. Um, and he jumped out in his rookie year this season. Uh, you know, after qualifying through the Bassmaster Opens in 2021, continued to be a extremely effective. This young Canadian angler, Cooper Gallant, again, going to be with us on our feature angler spotlight. Man, I'm really looking forward to this interview. I mean, don't miss Bass Edge Radio. We are, uh, you know, obviously on YouTube that we just started this year. So be sure to tune into that. And also at the same time, you can stream us on all your favorite podcast platforms. Uh, you can download load those almost everywhere. But be sure that you like and subscribe. You don't want to miss an episode. iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, all, all those great platforms. So um, stay tuned, you guys. It's going to be a fun fun show as i mentioned right after this break we're going to jump right into the feature angler spotlight with the PASS elite series come up on a sophomore season in 2024 classical feather cooper a lot y'all stay tuned we'll be right back you know the importance of protecting your investments so choose the protection the pros pick Grinding sand, abrasive rocks, and concrete ramps are no match for our patented technology. The MegaWare Keel Guard is made tough and made to stick. Install it yourself in less than an hour, providing the most dependable, most trusted protection for your boat, guaranteed for life. Insist on the original Keel Guard the pros have picked for 25 years. MegaWare Keel Guard. A rush of tournament adrenaline. Nitro, the choice of champion. Where performance meets play. Nitro, a big water beast. A pure kitchen machine. Nitro, release the champion with it. Here he is, as promised, our feature angler spotlight, Cooper Gallant. Cooper, man, thank you so much for joining Bass Edge Radio. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. I enjoy doing podcasts, so every time I get the chance to come on, and uh, it's always a good time. I love talking fishing, so. Absolutely, absolutely. You got to kind of be have this crazy passion for the sport to really uh, – get to your level and get to that elite series level or or the bass pro tour level the highest levels in the sport you almost got to be a nut job about bass fishing to get there isn't that right yeah you hear the word often said obsessed and you have to be <laughs> obsessed with it really i mean the amount of hours we spend on the water and um yeah it's pretty crazy you know we spend a lot of time out on the water a lot of the time behind the wheel on the in the truck and uh yeah you have to be obsessed with it for sure very cool, man. It seems to be a common theme, no doubt, man. You work really hard, obviously, to qualify for the Elite Series through that open division. You got in before they went to all nine, but you were fishing a ton of opens, you know, through that process. Man, after you worked so hard to make the Elite Series, tell us a little bit what your first year was like. Um, what was the way you kind of 
thought it would be in the Elite Series? Kind of what surprised you the most outside of what, you know, you felt like was probably, you know, a common vision that you had? Yeah, it was, uh, it was incredible. I mean, you know, you always, like, I've always dreamt of being there. And then to finally make it and, like, it's hard to explain. It's one of those things that, you know, it's everything I thought it would be plus more. Um, you know, like you're in the trough with all the guys that you looked up to, to for so many years. Um, and then, yeah, going back to like, there's definitely some surprises too. Um, one, not, not, this isn't so much a surprise, but this is something that stuck out to me the most throughout the season was practice okay. time. That was just super different, you know, like it was, we only get three days practice. Right. Whereas and, and old, almost we, two and a half, right? I mean, it's, you got that yeah. meeting a lot of times. I know some events you've got a day off, but, but, uh, Man, it's it's a lot different in the opens, as you mentioned. What were some of the adjustments you had to make because of that shortened practice period? Yeah, so adjustments, basically, you know, in, in practice in the opens, we obviously had more time. And I found in the opens, you're able to expand in practice more than I do now. And I still expand in practice on, on the Elite Series, but it's more of like, a, you know, instead of getting a bite, and fishing that area for three, four hours. Now I'm only fit getting a bite, and maybe fishing it for 10, 15 minutes. Um, wow. Just getting, just getting a clue and then kind of, you know, three days goes by quick. So eight times out of 10, I roll into day one of the tournament. A lot of times I don't know exactly what's going on, but I've got small clues and I kind of just, you know, in the opens, I got to the, the tournament day one. Usually I had an idea exactly what I was going to do. Right. But now it's kind of like, and sometimes in the elites this year, like I figured it out pretty quick, but sometimes I'm still figuring it out as the tournament goes on. So that was the biggest difference is just fishing quicker, um, you know, getting a clue, but not necessarily figuring it out until the actual tournament, whether it's day one, day two or day three. Gotcha. You know, let, let's go back a little bit. I think this could be some great information for the listeners you hear about anglers practicing heavily for the opens and spending some significant time because their goal is to get to the elite series. And of course, you know, you, you're take, not taking advantage of the practice time they allow. How many days would you average practicing for an opens event now that we know, you know, you're going at two and a half, three days for an elite series event? Um, so how many days did I average when I was fishing the opens? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So at the time, now you only get five days in the opens, but prior right. to last year, this past season, you could go out for two months if you wanted to prior to the tournament. Right. 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 Um, I was averaging five to eight days practice, five to nine days practice. So able to put in some solid amount of time. Obviously, we'll, we'll talk about this a little bit more in the podcast, but your Canadian angler uh, didn't grow up in the U.S. fishing in these styles of lakes. So there was a lot for you to learn and pick up. Were you able to learn uh, more about kind of U.S. fisheries, their nuances, specifically southern fisheries, um, as, as obviously they're going to be a little bit different than, than the Northern Brotherhood that, that you had there in Canada and, and maybe New York and that Northern half of the U S uh, what, what have you found through those open extended practices and now into your elite series practices that, that makes it most difficult to kind of pin down, uh, how you're going to fish an event? Yeah, it, it really all depends where we're at. Um, I mean, it's, it's crazy throughout the season. You go to so many different lakes. Obviously we go to nine and you know, you might go to one, one week. And then that following week, you might go to another lake. That's like the complete opposite. Um, right. Me being from Canada, the biggest like difference in like the it, tidal water, you know, we don't have tidal waters, tidal fisheries back home. So that is super different. Yeah. Um, that's probably my biggest weakness, and I, I need to start doing more. I love doing it. It's very cool. I like the whole concept. I like how it all works, and um, I like how it's, like, a big timing deal a lot of the time. Um, but as far as, like, going down south and stuff, and that's where, you know, we're lucky in Ontario. We've got so many bodies of water, mm -hmm. and we have so many different ways to catch smallmouth, so many different ways to catch largemouth. You know, we've got lakes that are – two to 10 feet deep that are chocolate milk, like Okeechobee. Right, right. 
Um, we have lakes that are tea stain color. We have river systems. We have, you know, Lake Ontario that's gin clear with big smallmouth. So we have a vast variety of different species with both largemouth and smallmouth. Yeah. Um, so believe it or not, like when we go down south, and when I say we, I mean like me, Chris, Cor, and Gussie, like when we show up to like Okeechobee, and a lot of people don't realize this, but when we go to Okeechobee, it almost feels like home because right, right. I have lakes back home that almost look identical to Okeechobee. And a lot of people um, don't, you know, think about that. Um, they think we all we have is smallmouth, but we have a lot of really good largemouth fisheries back home as well. Yeah, I think I guess that comes down to obviously Canada's got a lot of natural lakes. You get into some of those U.S. impoundments like Okeechobee, Santee Cooper, uh, some of those natural lake impoundments. And that's kind of where you're seeing a significant amount of those similarities. Would that be correct? Yep. Yep. Yeah. And I mean, like you go to somewhere like Santia, it's like you're, the vegetation you're fishing is a lot like back home. But like we don't have cypress trees like that back home. Right, like that's, right. you know, standing timber we don't have. Um, so that's different as well. Um, but yeah, there's uh, cool. you know, that's what's so cool about fishing. We get to go to all these places and learn. And yeah, uh, absolutely. I like so much about it. You're always learning. Well, obviously you learn pretty well and, and pretty fast. You you finish 17th place in your first Elite Series season in the Angler of the Year standings, which obviously qualified you for the 2024 Bassmaster Classic there in, in uh, Oklahoma. Luckily, I think we're catching up with you while you're in Oklahoma. Is that right? Yes, I am on Grand Lake right now. I uh, made a last minute trip. Uh, I zipped up here a couple days back and I spent four days on the water just idling around. Do not have a fishing rod in the boat. They're all at home. So wow. spending some time behind the wheel and just checking the lake out uh, before Very we come cool. back. Can't get enough of understanding bodies of water and where some of those uh, little secret areas are located that you could maybe tap into uh, in future events, specifically the Bassmaster Classic. Man, what will you do in the off season besides practice like you are right now for the classic doing some pre-practice get to know these these uh bodies of water maybe that you haven't spent a whole lot of time on but what will you do in the off season to kind of improve your game it's obviously uh evident through your open career through your elite series career you are freaking all in man you you've got all the chips on the table cooper gallant's trying to make the the next aoy championship the next uh, Bassmaster Classic champion. Um, what can you do during this off season to to help improve those standings after such a fantastic first season? Yeah, to be honest with you, I, I really only do two things, and that's map. Well, basically one thing is map study. So Google Earth, um, and you know I'm a I love staring at contour lines. Like I'll, I'll go to bed, I'll I'll be hanging out in the in the house, sitting on the couch, drinking a coffee in the morning. I'll just be on some random lake. It doesn't even have to be <laughs> where I have a tournament next year and just staring at contours and how different lakes set up. So that's one big thing. And one thing I do a lot um, going into like, so for like next season, I've been looking at all the lakes on, on Navionics and just sure. Google Earth. Uh, so a lot, a lot of map study. Um but other than that, I don't do a whole lot else other than pre-practice and then map study. But I definitely do like pre-practicing. Very interesting. You you hear a lot. Let's kind of dive into that map study because I think it's becoming – and you're a young guy. You're 26 years old, I think, right? 26? Yep. yep. Yeah, and it's almost becoming a lost art. You're getting so much technology in with the game, which, I mean, this is kind of your generation – but yet you're still doing the map study. But with the technology in the game, everybody thinks it's just drop the troller, look at forward-facing sonar, and just start scanning around for fish. Why do you think it's so important to continue the map study, understand the contours, and kind of probably relate that some to behavioral patterns throughout the series on lakes that you're going to be seeing? Yeah, it's super important. Like you said, like you can't just you know, buy forward facing sonar, put it down on the lake and just start catching big ones. Like you have to be in the right areas. Um, you have to understand where fish set up certain times of the year. And a lot of that comes from, you know, looking at a map and, and seeing where they're going to set up. And that could be, you know, something as simple as secondary points. They're going to get on secondary points pre-spawn before they move into back pockets. Um, 
little things like that, like just understanding contour and where they're going to set up. Um, fish highways, you hear that a lot, like where they're going to travel to and from. Um, and yeah, it's, I mean, it's like you said, it's more than just putting the patrol motor down and scoping around. Like you have to kind of have an idea of where they live and where they're going to or, or where they're going to set up uh, certain times of the year. Right. So you speak of a lot of classic fundamentals right there do you feel like these fundamentals that sometimes are being lost by by the younger generation because of forward facing technology um yeah sometimes yep and, sure. and what do you feel what, what do you feel like is the process that they can you know kind of overcome this what, because you, you hear a lot you know on youtube on on, on folks, you know, educational videos, they, they talk more about forward facing sonar or about how to use their side scan, but they don't talk as much about seasonal behavior patterns, different things and processes that, that happen throughout the year. Where, where would you send a young angler that wants to understand more about this process so they can catch more and bigger fish like Cooper Gallant would go, you know, kind of retrieve some of this information? Yeah, I think, I think a lot of that is just, I mean, it's crazy. You can, you can see a lot of, there's so much stuff out there online now, like YouTube, Google it. Yeah. Um, that's a big thing, but honestly, nothing beats time on the water. Um, nothing. And it could be, you know, they might have live scope and they don't know those seasonal patterns and they don't know how fish set up certain times of year and they could just go drop the live scope and then, oh, all of a sudden they start seeing big ones. Well, then they start looking at the map and then it all starts making sense to them. And the more they do that, the more they'll understand um, that kind of stuff. The fundamentals of it. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Man, so if you weren't on the road right now, obviously in Oklahoma, you mentioned practicing for the 2024 Classic there on Grand Lake. Would you be able to spend time, you know, on the water in Canada at your house this time of year? Or is this something where in order to practice some new techniques, kind of, you know, get involved with being on the water and having more experiences. You have to travel a lot. Or how does that set up for, for you being a Canadian angler? Yeah. Like right now you can get, uh, you can plop the boat in the water, but it's chilly. I mean, the water's probably, <laughs> 30, water's probably 30 degrees. Um, in the small mouth, they're probably chewing, but, wow. uh, no, it's one of those things like after the last event of the season, like I, I really do just kind of pack the boat away unless I'm pre-practicing down here. I don't do a whole lot of fishing back home. Um, I do some trout fishing in the fall and some other cool. multi-species stuff when I get the chance. Um, but mainly like, you know, during my off season, I just spent, I just spend most of my time just getting ready for the following season. Um, yeah. You know, with sponsors and, and things like that, preparing for next season, map study, uh, making sure I have everything, you know, making orders making sure i got baits making sure i've got everything i need that way when the season rolls around i don't have to worry about anything everything's ready right. to roll but uh yeah you can like the fishing's great right now back home but it's gonna start freezing any day now i mean I we don't so get are you are home. you a tackle freak do you have all this stuff in in specific compartments and cleaned out and you go through everything every fall early winter before the following season or what do you kind of just Toss it in the corner, get what you need, and get ready to hit the road in a couple months and just forget about it. Exactly. I'll be completely honest with you. I am the I am so unorganized. Like it is <laughs> like I'm organized and I've right. got everything, but it's a disaster. Like, <laughs> but you know where the disaster is located. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, I I try to be organized this year and I get the boat all dialed, and then like after day one of practice, it's back to being a disaster again. So now I don't even it's bad, but I don't know. That's, That's awesome. how I've always rolled and seems to work, I guess. Heck yeah, it's working. It's working, no doubt. Man, last year in Knoxville, since we're on the classic conversation right now, you kind of had a tough entrance into that 2023 classic there in Tennessee. Man, um, what did you learn from that classic experience that will take you to the next level in the 2024 classic in Oklahoma? Um, I think I, last year in the class, like I got pretty stubborn to be honest with you. Um, I really wanted to figure out the smallmouth deal and, uh, I spent like my whole practice trying to figure them out and I didn't, like, I wasn't seeing them nothing. And, 
and like what Gussie was doing and how he won, like that's like one of my favorite things to do. So I'm like, man, I, I got to figure out how to catch some small. He's like, you only need five of them a day, you know? Um, yep. And I mean, catching an 18 incher there is not easy, but if you catch five of them a day, you're going to have a good oh. tournament, if not win, just like Gussie did. So I really, a little bit of gamble for sure. <laughs> yeah. And I really stuck to that. And I also thought it was my best chance to win because I'm so comfortable doing that. And before you, before I knew it, practice was over and I'm like, I have nothing. Like I spent so much time trying to figure out the smallmouth. I didn't figure them out like at all. Like I think I caught like one smallmouth all week and, uh, yeah, I was just stubborn, but at the same time, you know, at the classic, you kind of have to be stubborn and like, yeah, I was going to ask you that. Do you feel like at the classic it's, you, you were good with it because it's kind of an all or nothing thing anyway, or, or how, how do you feel about that once you knew you weren't on too much? And then once the, that week had materialized, what was your, what was your take, you know, hindsight being 2020? It goes both ways. I mean, again, I'm disappointed. I should have just, you know, scrapped it after a day and a half of practice and went and tried to figure out a catch some big, large mouth. Um, but then, you know, if I scrapped it, a day and a half and didn't catch large mouth, I would have regretted not looking for small mouth. Right. So right, right. it goes both ways, but going into next year's classic, I'm just going to keep a real open mind and just kind of just do what I need to do to catch them and don't get so stubborn and, and just go with the flow and see how it all works out. But yeah, it was the, right. I think it's the worst tournament I've ever had, but it was the funnest week of my life. For sure. That's cool. That's cool. Well, you know, I hate to hear that you had the struggle, but at the same time, from a lot of listeners listening to how you broke that down and then what happened, you know, hindsight being 2020, as you described it, I think a lot of people can relate to that. And and your success has been so uh, tremendous. It's good. It, it's good to know that we're all kind of human and, and uh, you know, those kind of things can happen to everybody. So it kind of puts things a little bit into perspective at least. Yeah. Yeah. Um, man, let's go back north of the border real quick before we go to break. Uh, what's you talked a little bit about natural lakes, uh, uh, all these different environments that you have in Canada, uh, tannic waters and, and, um, obviously clear waters, big small mouth, large mouth fisheries, vegetation. Uh, you kind of, you know, re relate all of those things to us. But, um, you know, what's the vibe up there from an angler standpoint? Like when you're, when you come up to the ramp, if there's other people there, or are they like, oh man, there's Cooper Galan. Cooper's over there. <laughs> <laughs> How has it been since you've made the Elite Series, you've had success in the Opens, and you kind of came from being a kind of a, a hometown kid, right, to to really a, a bass fishing, uh, you know, national professional. Yeah, it's it's pretty cool. Um, yeah, it's it's weird because it, it still <laughs> doesn't feel real because, like, it literally – it, it wasn't that long ago when I was fishing high school tournaments, you know what I mean? So, like, right. it's just crazy how, how it all happened. And, and yeah, it's, it's cool. I mean – the, the fishing community back home is really small, which is awesome. Everyone knows everyone. Um, and, and, and everyone back home has been super supportive too. Like I have so many fishing buddies back home and, uh, it, it's been pretty cool. And a lot of guys, you know, a huge part to my success and why I'm even here right now is I was so lucky to grow up with so many cool people back home that used to take me fishing when I was 12, 13, 14 years old. Gotcha. Yeah. Right. Is, so yeah. that's probably the coolest part about it is, you know, you get all you, you're fishing a derby back home and you're against all these guys and like all these guys are your buddies. And again, all these guys, a lot of these guys are the reason why I'm even on the elite series is because I was able to fish at a young age and, and get into tournaments and things like that. So you me, feel that's like a lot of them now are kind of living vicariously through through your travels and adventures and and your your events there on the elite series yeah yeah and it and going back to the classic too a lot of them came down for the classic which was even cooler um Absolutely. it was uh yeah it's pretty incredible the support from all the my friends back home my family my parents my brothers it's uh it's awesome and 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 it means a lot to me and when i'm out on the water and you know, it's it's a team effort at the end of the day between the 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 family, friends, and sponsors, and 
And that's what I enjoy so much about it as well. Like if you win one or you do good in one, it's like, you know, we, we caught them, not just me. Like we caught them. Like it's cool. That is awesome. Now I know that Gusty lives uh, much farther west than than you do, and you're a little bit closer to uh, Chris and Corey Johnston up there, and in, in uh, you know kind of your neck of the woods, which is kind of that Toronto and spread zone, I guess more or less. You know that northern Ontario, uh, Lake Ontario, I should say, kind of kind of area. Um, do you feel like the the win that Gusty had in the classic kind of raised the awareness of bass fishing in in Canada in general? I know. Man, it's it hasn't been that long. It was just you know last what was it March, and uh, you were gone most of the year. But uh, do you feel like there's any change or excitement in bass fishing in 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 the country because of Gussie's win? Yeah, for sure. I mean, yeah, like I've already heard rumors of like a bunch of guys messaging me like back home from Canada, and they're wanting to get into the opens and they want to chase this dream, which is awesome. It's super yeah. cool. And yeah, Gussie for sure. I mean, Canadian boy just won the Bassmaster Classic. Right. Like it's crazy. It's not still sounds crazy to say that. You know, it's I remember before I had even started fishing the opens, you always heard, you know, you'll never see a Canadian go down and fish the elites or win a classic because we only get to fish, you know, five months of the year, four months of the year. And then, you know, Chris Corey and Gussie you know, proved a point back four years ago when they started fishing the elites and then Gussie wins the classic. Like it's right. definitely opened a lot of eyes back home. And and even for me, like growing up, I looked up to Gussie, Chris and Corey so much. And and I still do like we're buddies and I still look up to them. Like Gussie's my hero. <laughs> all right. I'm, I'm going to put you on the spot real quick. I got a trivia question for you. All right. Who was the first Canadian to fish in the elite series? <laughs> First Canadian yeah. fish in the elites. I think they all did all three at the same time, wasn't it? Uh, John Bond is the answer. Oh, to that I did know that. <laughs> you did know that. Okay, cool. Yes, I did know that. But I know you're a young guy, so and I know that goes back a while, so I wasn't going to hold it against you, of course. But, no, I, uh, yeah, that was probably I, like I, knew, 15 I knew John years pretty. Yeah, it was. He he started the original elite, uh, elite series when it changed over in 2006, and uh, I, I believe there was. A Canadian, maybe two that fished the top 100s back in the day. But uh, anyway, we're not going to go back that far. You're too young. I can't hold that. <laughs> so, but anyway, yeah, yeah. John was a good friend of mine uh, from Windsor, Ontario. Still guides up there at St. Clair. Uh, started a bait company, Bondi Baits. And he was shout out to John Bondi. Uh, but, you know, raising that Canadian flag, no doubt. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Very cool. Okay, last question. Um as far as uh, going up there, and uh, w- was it Chris, Gusty, Corey? Were those kind of the guys you were looking up to when when you were coming up through the opens, and that was kind of who you wanted to emulate, and what got you fired up about professional fishing? Yeah, for sure. Like I said, like I've always, you know, they've always like seeing them do it, and uh, you know, hometown guys. I mean, Gusty's right. north, but you know, all Canadian guys, and I looked up to them like crazy for sure. Um, you know, Chris, Corey, Gus, and then guys like, uh, Polinick, Ike and Ellie, the guys who made it through the nation. I grew yeah. up fishing the nation as well. The high school nation, uh, the junior stuff. Okay. And, uh, so I really looked up to the guys who made it through the nation and then, and then the Canadian boys for sure. Very cool, man. Very cool. All right. We're going to take a quick break. Uh, but first we got to give a special thanks to Bass Pro Shops reminding you always that we all live downstream we're going to return with more with cooper gallant y'all stay tuned right after this message we're going to get into best bass and tactics to implement for 2024 straight from cooper gallant y'all stay right there plenty of sunshine come on man let's roll what the to catch the fish, you need to be one with the fish. With PowerPole shallow water anchors, you'll get the ultimate in precision, power, and control so you can catch more fish. No face paint or phony fins necessary. 
Excessive shock and vibration are two leading causes for premature battery failure. Prolong the life of your batteries with the new MegaWare Battery Guard. The Battery Guard sits under your battery and absorbs excessive vibration and bounce, reducing G-Shock by up to 80%. Great for boats or anywhere shock and vibration can damage a battery. The Battery Guard can easily be trimmed to fit virtually any custom shape or battery size. Save money by protecting your batteries. Spend more time on the water and less on maintenance. Find yours at MegaWare.com. Welcome back. Here we go with the second half of Bass Edge Radio with our feature angler, Elite Series Pro Cooper Gallant in the house. Man, it's been a great first half of the interview. And uh, Cooper, we're going to dive into some uh, some tactics, you know, some ways to fish. We, we talked a little bit about it in the first half, talked about some fundamentals, seasonal behavior patterns, contours, all the things that have helped make your success what it is but uh man technique wise um kind of what would you say has been the root of your success up to this point qualifying through the opens having a fantastic top 20 aoi in your first uh stint on the elite series um I, I, let, let's let's tackle that first what's kind of been the root of your success yeah like looking back at at, at last year when i qualified for the elites through the opens there's a few different baits that got it done for me throughout the year, but you know, one technique that like really stood out to me and, and like, you know, what was from Hartwell because that's where I qualified was after the Hartwell event right? and uh, a shaky head. I, I right. caught him on a shaky head with a, just a worm and exone deception worm. Okay. And uh, yeah, that worm's got a special place in my heart for sure. You know, that's what got it done for me. And uh, throughout the whole season, I did catch a lot of fish on that shaky head. And uh, even this year on the elites, I've caught a lot of fish on a shaky head. But uh, going up through the opens, I'd have to say shaky head was a, a huge part to my success that season for sure. And then uh, a, a Demiki rig as well. A, a what rig? A Demiki rig, moping, Demiki. hanging a minnow, whatever you want to call it. Um, that's how I, uh, won on Cherokee and that's what okay. punched my ticket to the classic. So I'd say right. the shaky head and then Demiki rig. Let's break that down. I mean, obviously a Demiki rig, jig head minnow, you hear a lot of buzzword about that these days. Um, first let, let's talk about what makes that bait so special and maybe dial in like when you would use different weight sizes, different tails, uh, body shapes. Can we can we dig dig in a little bit deeper on the Dabiki rig and what makes it su successful for you? Yeah, for sure. Um, a lot of different ways to fish it. I mean, you know, you can hang it below the boat and you can really control it and keep it above the fish um, like no other bait. I mean, you can with the drop shop, then you got a weight involved and it just doesn't present the same as a Dabiki rig would. Um, so you're able to keep it above the fish and you want to keep it above the fish. You don't eat. Usually you don't want that bait going below the fish. Or they they kind of lose interest. So being able to like really control that bait upwards and keep make them chase um, is super important. You can cast it, you know, you can cast it again, keep it up high, uh, depending on weights. If you want to get it down a bit more, you can cast it like you can cast that thing 100 feet and twitch that thing back to the boat and they eat it. And I think it's so deadly because it's so... It really is subtle. I mean, okay. you know, that tail, that tail's moving quite a bit depending on how much you're twitching it, but it's subtle. And a lot of the times when they eat it, that bait's not doing anything. You're just sitting there hanging that bait over the boat. Um, and smallmouth, less is better for sure. I mean, especially for the big stubborn ones, whatever it is, just the less movement, the better. And when you don't think you're moving it, that thing's still moving down there. And I think that subtleness of it and that like just like super simple profile just it just gets bit. Right, right. So um when you say subtle, you're talking about like a straight tail um style of bait and, and what other tails or styles of baits with, with different tails do you do you prefer? Uh you got the forked tail, straight tail, paddle tail. Is there one that you particularly lean on most often? Um, just anything that's again, super subtle and like, doesn't have too, too, too much action. Okay. Um, you know, and like, it sounds weird saying I don't want a lot of action, but you, 
I think that subtleness and that that little bit of action at the back end of the bait, that back quarterback half inch of the bait really is just like doing this. And then like the rest of it's just so like stationary and it's just, again, subtle and they eat it. Right, and it's like right, with right. everything when you're drop shot and small mouth, less is usually more and, and having that, that little. Yeah, I remember 20 years ago, it used to be, you know, kind of keep that thing moving. And then, you know, 10, 12 years ago is don't move it. And it's kind of been that way ever since. But but like you mentioned, I think, you know, boat movement, uh, you know, movement from the wind, waves, whatever there is out there, that's still imparting some action to the lure that's that's attractive to the fish. Do you think that's what, what it comes down to? Yeah, for sure. And like, especially when you're hanging it below the boat, like even just the natural shake in your hands. Yeah. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Great point. Like, Great point. Same thing with a drop shot. How about weight sizes on that Demiki rig? Obviously, different conditions are going to call for different weight sizes. Kind of can break down a couple weight sizes that you use generally, mostly, I guess, and and why you would go from one to the next, and what's kind of like your your one punch. Like if you just had to pick one and everything was perfect, what weight would it be? It'd be a three eighths for sure, because um, you can kind of. You know, it's heavy enough where you can get it down below the boat quick enough and get it in the, in front of their face real quick. Um, and then yeah. you can cast it as well. And you can cast it, keep it up high in the column as well. And if you want to keep it real high in the column, I'll go to like a quarter ounce. Okay. Um, but like that three eight seems to be, you know, the a good all around. Like if you can only get one, I'd I'd get the three eights for sure. Okay. And how about how about how does line size play within this technique for you? Yeah, I'm usually running 10 pound Power Pro braid. Um, it all depends. I mean, the lighter the line, um, you know, it's it's gonna sink quicker. It's got thinner diameter. It's gonna get down there quicker, especially on a long cast with the bow in your line. Um, but I like to try and get away with 12. Um, okay, wow. Yeah, That's like when I, when I was on Cherokee, and it, it seems a little heavy, but when they're eating it, I mean. They, 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 key in on, <laughs> they key in on that bait so hard. And uh, I remember on Cherokee last year for the open, I was throwing 12 and I was able to like boat flip like three and a half pounder. So it's nice being able to to just get them in the boat, right? Kind and then get them a little bit. Yeah. yeah a, lot of the times there's, a lot of the times there's a big school down there. So like you want to get that thing in the boat and get right back down there right away. So I like having that 12. You can, you can horse on them a little bit more. Yeah, that's a great tip. I think most people would have thought, you know, eight or something. So uh, great, great stuff right there. Thanks for sharing that, man. What what are your preferred like uh, secondary methods? You know, I, l let's go real quick. I noticed, you know, looking at your performance last year, you ended with a bang, right? I mean, a, a top 10 at St. Clair, two top 20s at Champlain and St. Lawrence. Really what gave you the momentum to have uh, a top 20 AOY and, and really punch that ticket to the classic. Um, obviously you're from Canada, so it makes per perfect sense why you excel in those fisheries. Um, but what are some of the other, you know, methods that you kind of put to, put to the test and, on some of the Southern fisheries and, and what are your strengths in that department? Yeah, I like, um, you know, looking back at last year, to be completely honest, I kept it pretty simple all year. I really did. Um, I threw a chatterbait, swim jig, a Sanko, and a shaky head and a drop shot. Um, so five different baits pretty well throughout the entire season. Um, and, and all five of those things I love doing, minus the Sanko part, that's a little painful. But when you need right. a bite, when you need a bite, you know, it just flat out works. Um, yeah. But going into next year, I'm excited for next year because I feel like last year, like a lot of the stuff I like to do, I didn't get a chance to do last year, um, you know, like deep crank and um, Carolina rig and dragging a football jig, um, things like that, that I think we're going to be able to do a lot of this coming season. So I'm pretty excited about that, you know, throwing a jig. I don't think I threw a jig. Actually, that's a lie. I did throw it a little bit, but not nearly as much as I wanted to. So I think we're going to be able to do that a little bit more this year. Very cool. Very cool. Look forward to seeing that, man. Um, typically, obviously, uh, through the events, are, are you staying on the road? Are you able to get back home very much? And, and how does, 
How does an elite series system break down for a guy that's that's living in Ontario? Yeah, I uh, I spend a lot of time down here. Um, you know what? It all depends on like if we're off for like a month. Um, a lot of the times I'll go home, but if we only have like a week and a half in between tournaments, like right. it's almost pointless for me to drive, for example, 20 hours back home, hang out yeah. for four days, wishing I was fishing and then drive all the way back. Right. So I do stay down here a lot throughout the season. Like I mentioned before, I like to pre-practice, especially on lakes like, um, you know, like next year we're going to fork in Toledo, like standing yeah. timber everywhere. So, like, I'll go down there and pre-practice and spend three days just idling, learning my way around the lake. That way, when we go back down, I'm not wasting a day of practice just trying to figure out how to get around. Yeah, um, super critical on those short practice sessions, for sure. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I definitely am spending more time down in the States than I ever have. Um, just fishing as much as I can, spending as much time on the water as I can. Right. When you go back home, you still get to fish some local events, get to hang out with with those, those folks that you talked about earlier in the interview that kind of, you know, follow you through this whole process, took you fishing when you were younger. And uh, obviously Canada's got some big events, you know, you got the Canadian open and, and other things going on up there. Are you still able to take part in any of that stuff or is it pretty much just focused on the elite series and that's it? Yeah, I'm pretty, I'm pretty laser focused just on the elites and I miss it so much. Like, I miss fishing events back home. I did one tournament last year with dad oh, cool. um, and then did one with my brother as well for his birthday. And other than that, I didn't, I didn't do anything and, wow. and I want to, but it's just one of those things. I kind of just kind of, I kind of have to pick and choose. Right. And yeah, especially yeah. last year going into my rookie season, like I wanted to have a good year and I knew I needed to spend some time on, on different fisheries. And so I just put in the work throughout the summer and um, missed out on some tournaments back home, but going to try and do a, a, a little bit more next year, more than I did last year. Cause I did not do nearly enough back home last year. And I miss seeing all the, the guys back home too. Right. So, right. So, you know, coming through your, your first year, you make it through the opens. We've heard, uh, throughout social media over the last, you know, month or so, how difficult it is to, to, you know, make sponsor relationships and do some things like that. It's a little different for, I think, some of the Canadians because you can tap into a different market. You're promoting to a whole different group of anglers and a whole different market or industry of anglers up there in Canada. Do you feel like that makes it a little bit easier from a sponsorship standpoint? And how has it been from your first rookie year to now having success making your second classic in that top 20 in the AOI uh, through the Elite Series season, has that improved your position and able to uh, open up some doors for you? Yeah, it has, um, for sure. And um, going back to the Canadian thing, and is it advantage? It can be for sure. Because yeah. like you said, like, you know, we're in Canada, we're in the United States, we're kind of doing a little bit of both. Right. And uh, so, yeah, it's definitely helped out with certain certain sponsors for sure. Um Sorry, what was the next question? Just kind of like how has the progression from being a rookie and then having a great rookie year, now moving into your sophomore year, how has that established you as far as being able to uh, capitalize from a business perspective on that success? Yeah, it's helped. It's helped for sure. Um, I think there's just so much negativity going around in that right now. Like, yeah, there is. Last pro <laughs> angler can't get paid. But, but really, that's not – in, in my view, that's really not the case, is it? You just got to be able to, to uh, understand the business platform of, of what you're providing and then go go work it, right? For sure. Yeah, it just really, at the end of the day, it all comes down to how much you want to put into it. And however much you put into it, it's what you're going to get out of it most of the time, right? And that's kind of how I look at it. And uh, yeah, as far as sponsors for next year, I'm I'm pretty well rolling with with everyone I was with. Um since I started in the Bassmaster Opens and who I had on my jersey and boat last year on my rookie season. So um, going into 2024, the boat wrap is going to look a little bit different, okay. but uh, it's going to look pretty, pretty dang similar to last year's for sure. Very cool. Very cool. We look forward to seeing it and uh, supporting people that support the, the professional anger community for sure. Man, so if listeners are looking maybe to 
to uh, travel up north to Canada next summer. Um, I know it kind of, you know, doesn't really kick off till June, July. So let's say they're going up there in July and August. What are some fisheries you would say that you got to hit maybe your top three fisheries and why up there in Canada? I remember a few years ago, Simcoe was like the place to be. Is that still popping off the map? And give me your best three. Yeah, Simcoe is still really good. I don't get to get out there really that much, but um, I see the tournaments there every year, and and there's giant bags. Like, I mean, like I was saying earlier, like, water's cold there. Smallmouth are probably chewing. Like, you could go out on Simcoe right now and have a really good chance at 30, 32 pounds. Um, wow. You hear of 30, 30, 31, 32 bags. You hear of those being caught a lot throughout the fall. So that was definitely one on the on the list that I was going to mention was Lake Simcoe. Um, so as good, and, as good as Thousand Islands is, just a little bit drive north, it gets maybe even a little bit better. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, the num the numbers aren't there like the St. Lawrence. Okay, there are giants on Lake Simcoe. They're super fun to catch. Um, a lot of the biggest fish in the lake live in like less than nine feet of water, so wow. you're actually able to look at them, which can be really fun. And, uh, yeah, there's just giant smallies out there. It's, right. uh, What's cool. a couple more fisheries you could guide us to up there? And then the second one I'm going to pick for largemouth, and that would be the Bay of Quinney. And the reason I pick Quinney, um, I grew up. That's cool. Yeah. Quinney's got a very, very good largemouth, um, fishery. It's, it's, it's unique too, because it kind of, reminds me of some lakes down in the states they they really school up um you know they live out deep they live in that 10 to 17 foot um they get on hard spots they get on rock they school out in the abyss and chase bait wow um you can catch big ones shallow too like they're just all over the place and 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 a big one would be like a five pounder like a okay. 20 sack would be a good bag if you okay. can catch like 20 pounds a day you'd probably win a tournament but there's just so many three and four pounders and it's such a good fishery. A lot of hook setting going on. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. You got one more for us. Any, any rivers up there? Can you throw a river into the mix? I was going to say the St. Lawrence. Um, right. Right. That's a no brainer. What else? Right. Uh, we, that's, that's what's crazy. We have so many good lakes back where we're from. Like, Rice Lake, that's that's one of my home lakes too, Rice Lake. That's probably the okay. lake I fish the most. And yeah, I'd probably say Rice Lake. It's got some really big smallmouth too. Very cool. Very and cool, largemouth. Man. I like it. I like it, man. It's uh it's great to hear about things going on north of the border. Man, it's awesome talking to you, uh, being down here south of the border. And uh, I'm all the way down. I, I look at Lake Amistad, if you didn't know. And um, I, I, I'm, uh, I, I love it down here. But, man, I, I go up north every year to Thousand Islands and get that stretch. I might I might have to cross. Is it hard? Tell tell the, the, the listeners and myself, I'm, I'm really wondering, is it hard to cross the border with the whole boat rig and, and everything associated with going to fish up there in the Canada? Or how does that how's that process? Like crossing with the boat or just going into U.S. waters with your boat? No, crossing into from awesome. U.S. to Canada to go yeah, fishing at Simcoe. Yeah, it's not too bad. I mean, if you have a okay. passport and you got all that in line and you just tell them you're going fishing and that's all you are doing is going fishing, I don't yep. think you'll have a problem. No sweat. All right, yeah. man. I like to hear it. Well, I appreciate you being here on the show, Cooper, man. You got any closing thoughts or uh, remarks for the listeners before we conclude this, this uh, feature angler episode? No, just thanks for tuning in, and uh, thank you, Kurt, for having me on. Like I said, I like Absolutely. I like getting on these podcasts and talking fishing, and uh, looking forward to next year. And whoever's watching, good luck to you next year as well, and hopefully you catch some big ones. Heck yeah, man. Well, I'm, I'm going out to have some fun. I'm going to the West Coast for a couple of events, so I'm looking forward to fishing out at Shasta and Clear Lake and, nice. and doing some of that stuff. And, and I hope, even though I'm – from Virginia originally, relocated to Texas, man. I would love to see bass go back out there. We had some elite series events out there in 2007, 2008, and uh, man, they were some awesome events. I really think they grew the uh, fan base for the anglers as well. There's probably a lot of folks in California that don't know Cooper Gallant as much as they probably should because you could teach them a lot about bassing out that way. 
yeah, it'd be cool to go out there. Like I was saying earlier, we always like going to different fisheries and uh, I've never been out there. So that would, uh, I'd be, I'd be down for that for sure. Heck yeah, dude. It's, it's, it's a fun place to fish. So I'm going to go enjoy that. You have a great year on the elite series, man. We, we are going to be you. tuning into you out there. Good luck for these last couple of days in your practice. Classic. Uh, fingers crossed, dude. I hope you have a great year. Appreciate you being with Sierra Bass Edge Radio. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it, sir. Have a good one. All right, Cooper. Take care. Y'all stay yep. tuned. We're going to be right back with more the final concluding thoughts here on this episode of Bass Edge Radio. Nitro, a rush of tournament adrenaline. Nitro, the choice of champions, where performance meets play. A big water beast. A pure fishing machine. Nitro. Release the champion within. Nobody wants to run out of power when they're on the water. There is a better way. Introducing the Charge Marine Power Management Station from PowerPole that does the work of three devices, a traditional battery charger, a charge on the run, and an emergency start system. PowerPole Charge. Here we are. Back here with more Bass Edge Radio. And thanks again for uh, Cooper Gallant being with us. Uh, And I want to talk a little bit more and kind of review some of what I feel like is some between-the-line tips that Cooper brought to the program. Number one, and uh, man, true to my heart right here, is fundamental seasonal behavior pattern bass fishing. It is awesome to see a 26-year-old professional angler, which of course he didn't get there because he didn't pay attention to this, but... You know, so many times these days, I feel like young anglers rely so much on that forward-facing sonar technology. They lose the concept of seasonal behavior patterns, map study, and Cooper talked about how important map study was to him and his success out on the trail. So uh, doing a lot of work there in his house. There's so many ways you can do this these days, right there on your phone. You can look at any lake in the world, but man, if you know some lakes that you're going to, in 2024, start looking at them now. Start studying them. Start understanding what areas of the lake offer some of the best structure and um, best uh, areas that, that you should probably be breaking down once you get there and start practicing. And if you can understand some of the nuances within that zone, flats, points, Cooper talked about secondary points, uh, rivers, run-ins, all those different things that, that really create a seasonal behavior pattern and how fish move. Those bass highways Cooper talked about as well, which you hear all the time, but understanding those fundamental seasonal behavior patterns so critical. Um, there's lots of great videos out there on these things, um, but you got to dig a little bit because it's a little bit of a lost art, a lost uh, understanding. So, um, especially over these last couple of years, I feel like, but uh, understand your seasonal behavior pattern, do map study. Cooper had a great tip there. The next thing I really wanted to break down was, man, uh, this jig head, he called it the Miki rig fishing, but jig head minnow, um, obviously a big forward facing sonar technique to be able to uh, hover, uh, hover stroll, or, or jig this minnow above a fish's head. Um, really liked how we broke down line size and we talked a little bit about that based on his jig head weight size and some of his favorites. He said three eighths is his go-to. Um, I actually was really excited to hear. I mean, it's a little bit heavier than I would have thought he, he mentioned because he's he's a finesse guy, just small mouth guy. And um but uh, it was great to hear kind of uh, an understanding of where you might be able to start this process, but maybe with a 3 a ounce, you know, jig head, and then also some straight tail uh, plastics. He feels like the less 
is more. We talked, or I mentioned going back to where it used to be, you thought that a drop shot, you really had to shake the rod tip a lot and, and really had to get some movement on that bait. But really, there's plenty of movement going on just naturally with these plastics in the water, especially a softer plastic bait that's got some really nice undulation to it and movement throughout the water. You don't have to do a whole lot of uh, imparted action through the rod tip. You can kind of just let it do its thing and uh, just keep it high in the water column wherever you're locating the structure or fish, whether it might be brush piles or fish that you're seeing on forward facing sonar, could be rock piles, it could be uh, all kinds of different things, you know, standing timber out there in the lake where, you know, are good fish holding pieces of cover. So, uh, man, those are a couple big highlights I thought that Cooper brought to the show. Um, as well as his understanding of how he lives a majority of his life on the road. Man, that's got to be freaking tough. But as he mentioned, right out of the gate, it's an obsession. You got to be obsessed uh, to, to really get to what I feel like is that Elite Series and Bass Pro Tour level of that. I mean, you got to be freaking all in, on the water constantly, talk. I mean, it just consumes your life. That That's how people are most productive within this sport so be sure you spend some time learning more about bass and um you watching this youtube video is is number one so again i appreciate y'all being here it was great having cooper on the show breaking down more tips and tactics we're always trying to bring you some new educational information on what's going to make you a better angler hopefully you might be able to go back, if this is your first episode or maybe only your second or third episode of Bass Edge Radio here on YouTube, please go on back. We've got a great archive show of YouTube um, videos that started back in April. We also have uh, the audio portion here on YouTube that goes all the way back to a Patrick Walters uh, um, audio that we did. But again, you can go on to uh, BassEdge.com and we've got some great merch on there. Which side is it? See this merch right here? There you go. That's a t-shirt right there. We've got that available on BassEdge.com. We've got some hats right here, so if you're looking for uh, maybe a Christmas gift or something or just want to uh, represent the channel, man, it'd be awesome having you uh, rep it out with Bass Edge Radio clothes. And they're comfortable, man. I wear mine all the time, so be sure you check those out. Could be a great Christmas gift, um, as well as, I've got to mention, Megaware.com, Keelguard.com. Man, such great boat accessories for your products, or excuse me, for your vessel. Um, trick out your boat for 2024. Get some of those uh, MegaWare products. You will certainly enjoy them. Um, wow. That's going to take us to the end of 2023. Happy holidays to everybody out there in Bass Edge Nation. Of course, uh, the next time I'm going to see you, it's going to be 2024. Uh, we're going to have some updates in 2024 with some partners that we are really excited to have. But, uh, man, always great to have PowerPole with us, Keelguard, Mercury, a lot of great products associated with Bass Edge Radio. We'll be looking forward to that January 1 feature angler spotlight see what's going on be sure to hit that subscribe like button leave a comment down there as well adios y'all we'll see you next time so long and happy holidays from back